Today I'm talking with Jan Dustin Sørensen, Head of Communication of Archival Data at the Danish National Archives, Riksarkivet. Riksarkivet, the, says the Danish service provider. Today we're going to cover coping with COVID-19 and supporting researchers during the pandemic, as well as some exciting upcoming projects at the Danish National Archive. Tune in. You studied history in Latin and started your career in a public museum before starting at a national data archive as an archivist. How did you get to where you are today? And do you still read Latin? <laughs> yeah, well, um, it's true. I When I was in uh, in grad school, I was an intern at, the, at a public museum. And when I then graduated, I was probably hoping for a job at a museum because I really like that uh, that type of work, but of course uh, I needed a job, so I applied for any any job that I felt I could uh, that I could uh, do, and there was an open position at the National Archives for an IT archivist, uh, and I applied for it and I got that job. So that was just really, I was super happy. I didn't know much about archives, but I was so. So happy and so lucky that they uh, they offered the position to me because it turned out to be super interesting. Um, even though I started working with things that I had never really uh, heard much about before, I was uh, hired to do uh, appraisal of governmental data. Obviously, you come in with your history background and help define what type of information should we today keep for posterity. And even though I hadn't worked with that before, it gave it just makes so much sense for me as a historian right away that of course we don't just keep all the old stuff. We also need to make sure that we document today's society for future research. So that was what I did for the first couple of years doing appraisal decisions on IT systems from the public sector. We also worked with the approval of new IT systems to make sure that um, that government agencies uh, organized their digital information in a way so that it could potentially be submitted to the National Archives. Because often it can be very difficult and expensive if you have never thought about archiving before at some point the National Archives come and say, hey, we need a copy of your data. And you're like, well, how do we handle this? Um, if you start working with that at an early stage, it's much easier for you as an agency to do that. So we have a, a system of approval where we approve of IT systems uh, that they have taken the archives into account. Um, I also work with the preparation of transfer of data, what sort of documentation should they transfer with the data, et cetera, et cetera. So um, after a couple of years, I became head of that uh, section. And then in an organizational change uh, in 2007, I became head of uh, digital preservation. So that's when I went from history, more history with IT to IT sort of with history in the background. And then I was um, head of that section or that department until April this year when I moved on to um, the department that we call communication of archival data, which is obviously how do we make our data accessible? How can we make them uh, useful for people? And I feel it's a really big privilege to have started with on the ingest side, then move on to preservation. And now I'm in the uh, access. So uh, it, yeah, it's a, it's a big privilege to be where I am right now. Um, and this is now my 23rd year at the National Archives. And I would have never thought when I started at the National Archives that I would be there so long, but it's just, it just continues to be super interesting and a, a great place to work. So no more Latin. Oh yeah, I forgot about the Latin. I don't really read Latin. I tried uh, this in the winter because uh, <laughs> there was nothing we could do. We could, you couldn't go out, you couldn't invite people over, you couldn't anything. I started actually um, reading uh, from uh, Caesar's 
uh, Gallic Wars, the Velo Gallico, <laughs> but uh, I didn't get that far. And then spring was here and I could start doing something outside instead. So I guess the potential is there for me to pick it up again at some point, but uh, I would have a hard time reading Latin right now. Mm. Thank you. That definitely sounds like maybe more of a winter activity. It is, yeah. <laughs> Can you highlight three main ways that your work has supported researchers over the last few months? Yeah, um, that would be the work of my department more than my own personal work, because uh, I don't think that I could point to something that I have done personally, but my department certainly has. Um, and one of the things that we do and we do quite a bit is to actually hand out data to to use in re research projects of certain quite my, quite many different types of research uh, projects and also uh, actually uh, agencies or authorities that want to use the data that they have submitted to the national archives so uh, a main part of our work is to make sure that researchers that need data that have been submitted to us can get access to them. We hand them out, either they can download them or we can uh, give them specifically our data. Um, and, uh, and that's certainly one thing that is, has been very important, not only in the last three months, but, uh, but for a very long time. Uh, and very much the reason why we are, are there. And we have researchers for, even also from other countries that uh, use our collections. And, and of course, we think that's super. Um, then we have, we have established a new site that we call Folk i Fortiden, or People in the Past. Um, and it's basically a map of Denmark where you can pinpoint, uh, say, a parish that you're interested in. And then you can get information about the population in that particular area. Um, based on transcribed data from censuses or parish registers. So you could say, for instance, in 1850, what was the distribution between men and women in the parish that my great-great-great-great-grandfather lived in? Um, what was the age uh, distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So we have tried to take data that we had um, transcribed and, and uh, present them in a new way so you can download also these uh, data from that uh, that site, people in the past. Um, and of course, it's appealing for genealogists, but we certainly also hope that a lot of other researchers will be able to see the potential in, in, in accessing data about uh, uh, census and uh, parish registers, et cetera, uh, this way. So that's another thing I would like to point to. Um, and then the third thing we have been working on. It's not completely done yet, but it will be uh, sometime this year. It's a new platform that will exhibit metadata about both governmental data and research data on the same platform. Uh, we have at the National Archives collected many born digital data uh, over the years, also with metadata, but they have not been exhibited um, to a good extent. So we had much more information with data than what we actually presented on our website. So now we will have a new platform that will present metadata in a much better way. And I think one of the really good things about this is that this platform will show our entire collection of born digital data, no matter if it was research data originally or it was governmental data, you can see the entire collection presented on the same platform. Uh, and hopefully, of course, this will make it easier for researchers to, uh, to realize that if they have usually worked with governmental data, there's also a huge collection of research data. And the other way around, if they have been used to working with research data, wow, there might be something in the governmental digital records that they could use for their research. So that's the third uh, thing, and we will launch it uh, later this year. Thank you. It sounds both interesting and useful. Mm. So it's been a productive period. It, it has actually, yeah. Can you tell us about some exciting upcoming data projects from DNA? And then I had a second question, which was, you are also chair of the DLM forum. Can you tell us more about your work there? So it's kind of a double question, so you could choose which one you, you want to. Well, uh, I could almost 
answer too, because uh, it's true, I've been the chair of the DLM forum since 2017, but uh, and I've been part of the board or the executive committee since 2015. So I actually decided that it was time for me to step aside and let somebody else take over. So just last week, we had uh, the annual general meeting where I said uh, bye to the executive committee. And uh, so somebody else will take over uh, as chair of the DLM forum. So that's a closed uh, chapter, although I have really, truly cherished the, uh, the chance to do some international cooperation and networking with colleagues uh, in other countries. Um, so no more DLM forum for now. Upcoming projects in the Danish National Archives. Well, um, first of all, we are in the process of defining a new standard for how you submit data to the National Archives. We are working on implementing new European standards for database preservation and the package structure that you use when you submit data. Um, we have been uh, an active part in the, the project that has developed those uh, new standards. So now we need to implement them in our own legislation so that we can actually use the new standards and also make sure that the Danish National Archives becomes part of a, a larger community for uh, the preservation of digital information. And from my new perspective uh, as head of the communication of archival data, this is super interesting because it will also make it possible for us to make new access solutions together with other European countries, rather than just uh, defining and developing everything ourselves we will in a few years be able to uh, give access to our data using tools and methods that we have developed together with other uh, institutions. So I think that is really, uh, that's really promising and very uh, interesting. What's also very interesting uh, from my new chair uh, in, the, in the communication of archival data is that this time around, we have been really focused on taking the user perspective into the definition of the requirements that we set up for submission of data. Obviously, we have also always thought about how do we make data accessible, what sort of documentation is needed, et cetera, et cetera. But now that we have a lot more user experiences than we had um, 11, 12, uh, 12 years ago when we defined the last piece of legislation, we can much more say when you submit data to the archives, you need to do this and that, you need to document like this, you need to describe it like this, because that will make it easier for our users um, to actually use the archive data. So I think that the a process that will lead to new regulations with the users in mind is really promising and, and interesting. Um, so that's uh, one thing that we are doing. Another thing is that we do have a number of projects uh, sort of in the pipeline that will take um, digitized paper records and using OCR or HDR to create new data sets. Um, some of the, actually a lot of our records are uh, state protocols where you have uh, columns with numbers and we are experimenting with digitizing those protocols and converting using OCR or HDR, the numbers from the columns to a data set that then you can that you can then use as an actual data set. And I think that's something that we will do a lot more in the coming years because it will open up a collection in a completely new way uh, for, for data researchers instead of just people who, will, who are willing to uh, just go page by page in a paper book. Um. Could you just spell out what OCR means? Oh yeah, uh, OCR is optical character recognition and HTR is uh, hand uh, text recognition or hand written text recognition. And the point is that if you do that, uh, optical character recognition is usually for, uh, for printed text and HTR is for things that are written by hand. The computer can then read it and convert it to uh, yeah to a data set. Thank you. Well, I've learned something today, mm. <laughs> so that's good. 
Some exciting projects then. Yeah. So just last year, you completed a Master of Public Governance at Copenhagen Business School. What do you intend to do with this? Um, I think back in the old days, if you were the head of a department or something, you would usually be uh, the smartest specialist. And the reason why you were chosen to, to head a department would be that you were the one who knew most about that particular uh, area that they worked with in the department. But that's not the way things work today uh, anymore. Uh, you have to do a lot more as head of a department or a manager um, that doesn't necessarily have, is so much about um, all the specialized tasks that you do in your department, but to manage change, to make sure that uh, the organization works, to make sure that people feel well. It's a, there's so, so many other things where you need to learn what it is to, uh, to be a manager. So I would say that the, um, the master of public governance is an education that should help you to be a good manager in this public sort of public domain, if you can say so, uh, because we have a lot of requirements for what it's like to be a public manager. So what I will do with it is to hopefully improve, continue to improve as a manager uh, and then manage the specialists who know their things much more than I do. I mean, they are the specialists and what I'm doing in the department is pretty much to be uh, the manager. And I hope that the MPG uh, education will help me be a better one. Thank you. Definitely sounds inspiring. Um, I would say that Denmark is uh, is on track. We have uh, set up uh, a system where, obviously, uh, state agencies they have to notify the national archives on their IT systems, and then the national archives they will make the appraisal decision and make sure the data is submitted before they become obsolete. We have, uh, I'd say, a, a relatively good uh, procedure for the actual preservation uh, of data. And, um, and we also have a, stru a structure in place for making data accessible. So I'd say that overall we are on track, but what I have learned from being a uh, head of digital preservation is that it's always or very often a bit complicated when it comes to IT. There's always something that you haven't uh, thought about there's always something that requires a specialist that you haven't thought about. Um, so we certainly should make sure that we always uh, have the right resources to continue to, to do this work because it's not a type of work where you can say that you're finished at some point because technology always develops and the technology that the uh, agencies use, for instance, when they produce data or even worse uh, or better, uh, all the technology that is used in research institutions to produce research data will just continue to give us new challenges um, that we have to, uh, to deal with. So I'd say one really important lesson is that this work is never done and you have to make sure that you keep up with uh, technology because you can't just make the world stop going around because you need uh, um, time to think about how to handle the complexity. Um, also, obviously, I have learned a lot about the collection of data because my um, department was where we received data, um, made the quality assurance and made sure that it was preserved. So I see that right now in my new position as something that's really beneficial because when they discuss hey do we have something that can help us in this uh, new project with uh, health data or with election data or whatever 
quite often I can actually remember that, hey, we, we got this data from that particular agency, so maybe you should have a look at that. So, uh, mm. Thanks. How do, you, how do government data and research data supplement each other? What do today's research data users need? Mm. Um, it's, it's been very important for us in the, in the past couple of years to make sure that we don't divide too much between governmental data and research data, because for, from a research perspective, uh, if you want to, um, to do research in a particular area, uh, you should be aware of both the research data that we have in that particular area, but also the fact that a lot of government institutions might have worked with that area and you could find really useful material um, in governmental data. So from a researcher perspective, we would like them to just look at our collection as a whole and then be open to uh, the fact that they might find information they can use both among our governmental records and among the research uh, data uh, that we have. Uh, so they, from a researcher or a historian perspective or whatever, I'd say that they are two really important components uh, that you should look at together. But of course, <clears throat> sometimes research data, especially survey data that we have a lot of, they have some characteristics that uh, that you might not find in governmental data. So of course, it's really important that we also keep our research data in a form that you can reuse um, for research projects that look like the old research projects, for instance. Um, so of course, we should also uh, keep in mind and respect that um, they have been created under different conditions and they might also uh, be used under different conditions. And what was the last thing? What was what do today's research users need? Well, yeah. <laughs> what do they need? Um, I think they need uh, good metadata so that they can understand the data that we have, and uh, especially, well, not especially, but also good metadata for the exploration phase where they are looking at what type of information do they have at the National Archives. They need the information that will make it possible for, for them to see that this particular data might come in handy for their research project. So good metadata for the exploration phase, but also good metadata for the actual use of data to make sure that data are documented in a way so that they can actually reuse, uh, reuse them and make sense of them. Um, they, yeah, I think that would probably be the most important uh, things. And maybe they also need, um, inspiration to how can they use data. And sometimes I think it would be a good idea for us at the archives to have some showcases of how data have been used so that they can get inspiration to research projects that they could use or do based on our, our data. So metadata and inspiration in yeah. these cases. <laughs> Sounds good. So one of CESDA's core products is our data management expert guide, which you may be familiar mm -hmm. with. What are the main barriers for the reuse of research data and code and how can we tackle them? Um, I think one barrier could be the lack of technical knowledge, uh, not in the sense that uh, researchers don't have technical knowledge, but if you want to uh, broaden a group of people working with your data, uh, then you might look into how we can give them the necessary technical skills to work with this particular type of source material, especially if you are, say, a historian and you're used to working with just documents. We need to look into how can we uh, make it easier for you to work with, say, an, uh, a statistical data set or a database or something like that. So to make sure that, uh, that the researchers or the users have the right uh, technical skills uh, is one thing. Um, I could also mention GDPR, the European Data Protection Regulation. I wouldn't necessarily call it a barrier, but uh, I think many researchers have experienced that this whole 
concept of working with personal data uh, under sort of secure circumstances is difficult. So maybe um, it's a good idea to to certainly look into the pseudonymization. I can't say that one. So, whatever. Anonymization, pseudonymization. Anonymization. <laughs> yeah. Uh, taking out the personal identifiable information from those data sets uh, so you can work with them because if you want to work with them with the, the complete data set and complete information about identifiable persons, then you at least need to put a lot of extra um, things in place for you to work with that. So GDPR, not necessarily a barrier, but certainly something that you need to think about and that might make your life a little bit more complicated. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, those are other main things I would like to mention here. Thanks. So our final question mm -hmm. is, what are you most looking forward to achieving in 2021? Mm -hmm. And of course, this can be a professional project, a personal project. Feel free to mention either. All right. Or both. Um, uh, our department, the com which is called Communication of Archival Data, is a new, relatively new department. It was created uh, last year in January, only a few months before uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic closed everything down, uh, and then we uh, got this uh, a period where we didn't have a, a a leader and now i'm the manager since uh, april so it's a very new department where we have been very very little together physically so i think i think that my main goal for 2021 is to make sure that when we uh, begin 2022 we have a clear direction for our department and we have uh all the things in place that might still be a little bit up in the air because of those difficult uh, circumstances. So um, uh, to achieve a situation where my, my new department uh, feels like we have the right foundation for our future work is that's my main goal uh, for 2021. Thanks. And any personal, any personal projects or goals? To get, to get some more flowers on my balcony, but uh, I, they have a tendency to die. So that's uh, certainly something to remember to water the plants. <laughs> <laughs> well, look how fast oh, yeah. we were. We we're uh, done on time. So I felt like throwing in a little more fun question because I realized they were all very, <laughs> very yeah. serious. So I was wondering, yeah, in terms of when it's nice, when there's nice weather in, in Copenhagen, like today, when you're done with the interview, what is a a typical activity that you would that you would do or a nice place that you would go to around Copenhagen mm. or what what would what would you do now on a nice day in Copenhagen? Yeah. Uh, well I live by the beach uh, and I uh, swim all year round. Um, well actually I guess swim is too much to say because in January or February I certainly don't swim, I just dip and go up. But now it's uh, it's warm enough that you can actually swim. So that's something I really love to do to to go there and and take a dip in the sound between Denmark and, and Sweden and also uh, to take a run along the beach. Um, since I live in the city, uh, I have to take advantage of the fact that I live very close to the beach and can get some fresh air uh, as well. Um, so that would be uh, two typical things to do. That sounds wonderful. Definitely. <laughs> it's it's a very beautiful beach here uh, in, in Copenhagen. Well, where is it in Copenhagen? It's on the uh, the island where the uh, the airport is. So some mm. south of uh, south of the city center been a long time now. I was actually there for the COP, for the climate oh, conference yeah. in 2009. Oh, yeah, that's been a while. I, I really loved Copenhagen. It was beautiful. And I think I went back once after that. But it's been a little while now, but it's very attractive. You certainly me, should uh, come back at some point. I would love to. <laughs> I know it's been uh, really, really the hardest thing with uh, with this situation of Corona is not being able to travel. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you don't necessarily need to travel as much. As, uh, as we were traveling before, but a little bit of travel would be nice. Yeah. Uh, the last time I was on a plane, I had actually been in uh, Norway, and that was in February last year. I haven't flown anywhere since then. 
not not in Bergen though, were you? No, I wasn't in Oslo. I visited the the national archives in Oslo. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this really interesting interview.